Hi, this is the third lecture for nanofabrication technology course. And in the first lecture, we talk about the introduction of nanotechnology and the scope of the class. Last one for the second lecture, we start talking about surface energy, which is the no dominating factor causing or prohibiting the formation of nanoparticles. And in this lecture, before we start talking about synthesis of nanoparticles, this step is very important to, uh, it is very important step in the fabrication of nanoparticles. We will talk about the stabilization of particles. Before you understand about stabilization of particles, you have to know the cause or why we need the stabilization. Basically, nanoparticles tend to agglomerate, and the reason why it, they agglomerate together is about the interaction between particles. Okay, the most fundamental interaction is van der Waal bonding or van der Waal force. If we consider atom like helium, which has only two electrons circling around the nucleus of the atom. At one particular moment, you may see that two electrons might locate it near each other, making this part of the atom to be seems to be negatively charged. On the other hand, the opposite side of the atom would become positively charged. Keep in mind that this charge is not permanent. It occurs like this only at one particular moment in time. So, for that particular moment in time, if I have another atom, another helium atom, which also have the same charge, like, like so. So, we have positive charge on this side of an atom, and negative charge on the opposite atoms. So, therefore, attraction force occurs, making these two atoms attracting to each other. If I have another atom, which also have charges like so, you have to understand that attraction force by the difference in charges is considered as a long range force. So that means even though two atoms are further apart, the attraction still exists. Of course, the longer the distance, the weaker the attraction the further, I mean, the closer two atoms becomes, the higher the attraction force, okay? Of course, for the next moment in time, electrons on each atom would move away to somewhere else, and the charge di distribution within an atom would be different. So the attraction in this picture would change with respect to time, all right? Now, if you imagine, if you understand attraction by van der Waal force like in this picture, in this picture we describe attraction from atoms. Now you have to imagine these atoms as part of a solid particles. So if I take atoms inside solid particles, of course each atom within the particles contains electrons, and electrons are moving around. So one moment in time, atoms on the particles may also be charged, okay? So you might have negatively charged atoms on the surface of a particle on the left-hand side. And you may have positively charged atoms on the other particles. So this difference in charges makes two particles attracting to each other same principle as atoms, just have a bunch of atoms together as a particle, okay? This van der Waal force also makes particles attracting with each other, resulting in the agglomeration. All right? Now, for agglomeration to take place, there are two factors. 
First is a Van der Waal force that we already discussed. As I said, the further apart the atoms, the weaker the attraction. So if we plot between potential energy with respect to the distance between particles or between atoms, you see that the function of this potential energy is going to be like this red line. Okay. Please note that the potential energy for this attraction is negative because potential energy from the difference in charges can be calculated based on Coulomb's law, which depends on charge of two atoms. Okay, one atom must be positive charge. The other, the other atom must be negatively charged to get attraction. So therefore, the potential would always be negative. All right. And the long, the longer the distance between two atoms, the smaller the potential or the smaller the attraction force. All right. The function is nonlinear because the Coulomb laws depends inversely to R squared. The other factors affecting the agglomeration of particles is Brownian motion of the particle itself. Because in the diluted system, particles are so far away from each other. If you look at this graph, you will see that further away, the attraction is negligibly small. So in order to make attraction strong, two particle must come in the vicinity of each other. How can we how can we achieve that? Basically, be, simply because nanoparticles can also move randomly like atoms. Okay, that random movement is called Brownian motion. So once we know that attraction force and the movement of, of, of the particles are two major causes for agglomeration. So in order to prevent agglomeration, we need to prevent one of these at least. But preventing particles to move is almost impossible. It is very, very hard. So what we will focus on would be preventing the force itself or preventing the Agglomeration or preventing two particles to adjoin to each other after they become closer together. The way to prevent agglomeration is called stabilization. And we have two ways for stabilization. The first one is called electrostatic stabilization, with which utilizes the charge to stabilize particle. The other one is called steric stabilization which utilizes uh, lengthy molecules to prevent agglomeration. Okay? In this lecture, we will discuss both of these uh, st stabilization techniques. Let's start with electrostatic stabilization. Before you understand about electrostatic stabilization, you need to understand about charge. So suppose I have water in a beaker. Okay? And water naturally can dissociate into proton and hydroxyl ion. Of course, you have to understand that this dissociation is not complete. That's that's mean not all of the water molecules dissociate into these ions. So within these beakers, you have proton you have hydroxyl ions, but you also have water as neutral molecules as well. So the extent of the dissociation depends on pH of the water. Okay? At neutral pH or pH of 7, you can calculate how much proton we have and how much hydroxyl group we have, but mainly it's still neutral water molecules. But Considering the charge, we can see that there will be a positive charge from proton and negative charge from hydroxyl ions dispersed somewhat uniformly within the beakers. So if you look 
at the beaker as a whole. The total charge of the beakers, of the beaker here, will be zero because the number of cation and anion is always equal. Okay, in this case for water dissociation. However, if you look locally, each position at each position, you might see non-uniform distribution of charges. So one particular position in beakers might have high concentration of protons and therefore that area would become positively charged. On the other hand, the other area might be negatively charged. Okay. So if I put a particle in this solvent, which is electrolyte, okay, like so, there will be interaction between ions in liquid and the surface itself. If you recall what we discussed in lecture 2, on the surface, the charge or the bonds of atoms on the surface might not be complete. Atoms on the surface always have dangling bond, and that dangling bond is ready to capture anything, including ions in water or in electrolyte. Okay, so there will be ion and surface interaction, which makes the surface charged eventually. The surface can be charged by many, many mechanisms, including adsorption of ions. That means ions will sit on the surface, making the surface being charged. Or some charged species, I mean some neutral species, may dissociate on the surface, making the surface charged. All right. You may have substitution of ions. That means some ion from the surface is going out, being replaced by some other ions from liquid. If the charge being substituted is not the same, then the surface may be charged eventually. You can also be in charge. The surface can also be in charge by electrons as well, either by accumulation of electrons on the surface, making the surface negatively charged, or depletion of the electron from the surface, making the surface positively charged. And lastly, you may have physical absorption of charged species on the surface. Charged species may be like anion, hydroxyl ion like this, this is called charged species. If hydroxyl ion is absorbed on the surface, then the whole surface is being charged. All right. So all of these causes make the surface charged. So if I zoom in into the particles, the green area here is a surface of the solid particles. This black line is the interface between solid and liquid. In the blue area, this is water. Okay, for this example, this is water. The water is dissociated into proton, positively charged, and hydroxyl uh, cation, anion, which is negatively charged. Okay. At first, distribution of cation and anion is usually uniform. Right? But once we put solid in the liquid, there might be a transfer of one particular charge ion onto the surface, depending on what kind of surface it is. So if my surface or if my solid requires positive charge to be neutral, for example, if I'm looking on the oxygen terminated surface, let's say I have zinc oxide and some area or some surface of zinc oxide particles 
may also con may contains only oxygen and oxygen is negatively charged by nature so it requires positively charged ion from the electrolyte okay in that case the positively charged cation would come adhere to the surface like in this picture all right if just like in this picture positive charge is absorbed onto the surface this cation is called charge determining ion okay so whether charge determining ion being cation or anion that depends on the surface depends on properties of your surface all right in this example cation is charge determining ion and the rest or anion in this case is called counter ion all right now if you look at this picture far away from the surface you see that around this area distribution of charge determining ion and counter ion is uniform okay positive sign and negative sign here away from the surface is dis is a uh, uniformly dispersed or di uniformly distributed on the other hand around here there's a lot of positive charge around here there's a lot of negative charge all right so this area on the left hand side of this dotted line the distribution of charges within liquid is no longer uniform okay outside this line distribution is uniform the line here is imaginary line called slip plane okay so outside the slip plane the distribution of ions is homogeneous within the slip plane distribution is inhomogeneous okay so I'm going to highlight the area within the slip plane by yellow area like so this area eventually um, this area is basically liquid within this liquid the charge distributed non-uniformly and this yellow liquid will always go with the particles this yellow area is called electrical double layer okay why did I say that this yellow area would always go with the particles or bound with particles you have to imagine that in this example cation here absorbed permanently somewhat permanently to the surface of the particles so whenever wherever this particle goes this positive charge would go with it all right so therefore the negatively charged ions next to it would be attracted to this positively charged ions so in general these whole things within the yellow area will always go with the particle so if I have two particles each of them has its own double layer okay of course the the, the thickness of the layer the, the actual thickness of electrical double layer is very very thin in the order of nanometers or even angstrom okay it's very very thin not thick like this picture I exaggerate this picture so that you understand so if you have two particles each of them contains electrical double layer according to example I give I give you I gave you on the surface is positively charged outside is negatively charged okay so when two particles comes closer together by browning motion 
at some certain point, two electrical double layers will overlap before two particles collide. Okay, the overlapping of this area causes repulsion because if you imagine inside this yellow area is heavily containing the negative charge, right? So when you have negative and negative together, repulsion occurs. So repulsion occurs by the same charge within electrical double layer of two different particles. Okay, so that's one mechanism for the repulsion. But there are another. The first one we discussed comes from the same charge within the double layer. The other one is called osmotic flow. Okay, remember that I told you from the very beginning that within the electrolyte, there's a positive charge, there's a negative charge, and there's also neutral molecules of water. Okay, so when you imagine this overlapping area highlighted by orange or yellow here, you should imagine that there's a negatively charged, the concentration of anion within this area is being doubled, okay? Making the situation within this highlight area to become non-equilibrium. All of the sudden, if, if you imagine all of a sudden, the concentration of hydroxyl ions within the area is double. When it is double, that means concentration within this concentration of water of neutral water within this highlight area is much smaller than outside. Okay, you can also say that concentration of water of neutral water outside this overlapping area is much higher than inside. Whenever we have high concentration somewhere, okay, and low concentration somewhere else, that would give you osmotic flow, okay? So this difference in concentration of water drives water in this area. So when water is driven into this highlight area, it will push two particles apart. This is called osmotic flow. And this is the major mechanisms preventing two particles to collide with each other. Without collision, then agglomeration will not occur. Okay? So this is the mechanisms of the stabiliz stabilization that we call electrostatic stabilization. Now, if we consider the potential the repulsive potential from the same charge within this highlight area. We can also calculate potential energy just like what we did for Van der Waal, uh, attraction force. Okay. But in this graph, the repulsion force should have a positive sign because it is resolved from the same charge being repulsing with each other. Okay. The closer they become the stronger the repulsion okay so the function of repulsion should increase like this blue line so if we plot the same graph together with the attraction from van der Waal force okay these two lines are not the same the function are different and you should see that attraction force is a little bit longer range I mean uh, attraction force can feel each other even they are further apart the repulsion occurs only when they are overlapping so repulsion force is considered at short uh, rank short short length force and the Van der Waal attraction force is considered long range all right so if I combine these two functions together, what I get would be something like this. Okay. The green line 
is the combination of red line and the blue line. Basically, you take red line and blue lines, add added with each other mathematically, you get a green line. And you see that in the long region, when the distance is further apart, the green line still has negative negative sign. So that means within this area, attraction is dominating. Okay? Within this area, the green line becomes positive. That means repulsion dominates. However, if the distance becomes closer than certain level, then attraction becomes dominant again. Alright? What does it mean? It means that two particles further apart still attract with each other. We cannot prevent that. But when they become closer together to some certain distance, we can prevent agglomeration. However, if the collision of two particles are too strong, and then and they collide somehow be, being closer together to some certain distance, then we can no longer prevent agglomeration because attraction eventually dominates. Okay? So this height of the function is called repulsive barrier. This is the barrier for prevention of agglomeration. If this barrier is overcame, then two particles will eventually agglomerate. This height, the height of the barrier, the higher the barrier, the better the prevention of agglomeration. Okay? The height of this function depends on the structure of double layer. So it depends on the concentration of ions within the electrolyte. Of course, it also depends on charge of the ion itself. You may have oxidation state to be plus 1, plus 2, plus 3. The higher the charge, the higher the, the repulsive barrier. So if the barrier is greater than 10 kT, where K is Boltzmann's constant and T is temperature, then the theory, theory said that the barrier is high enough to prevent collision by Brownian motion. Okay? So you can also see that within this function, if I increase the temperature, okay, suppose I have the electrical double layer form at some certain situation, and I increase temperature. On one way, the increase in temperature would increase kinetic energy of the particles making the particles collide with each other more strongly. And that would give you the overcome of this repulsive barrier easily. Okay? So at higher temperature, the barrier required to prevent the agglomeration is supposed to be high. Otherwise, the particles will collide because of the higher in the kinetic energy of the particle itself. That's why this barrier is supposed to be a function of temperature as well. All right. The technique here, the electrostatic stabilization, has limits. Its limitations include being kinetic stabilization method. That means uh, if the barrier is overcome, then two particles cannot be redispersed. So once they agglomerate, they cannot redisperse. So that's that means if somehow you got agglomeration, there's no way you can redisperse these agglomerate particles. It is applicable only to dilute system. The word dilute here means the number of particles within liquid supposed to be small. Okay, not the concentration of electrolyte. This is the concentration of particles within the liquid. Why? Because agglomeration depends on chance for the collision. The higher the number of particles within the liquid, 
the higher the chance for agglomeration. Okay, this technique relies on not frequent uh, collision, not so frequent collision. And this technique cannot prevent other forces rather than van der Waals force. All right. So attraction by something like permanent dipole moment may not be prevented by this technique. It is difficult to use this technique to multiphase system like if you have gas, liquid and solid together within the same system then it will be very difficult to use this technique. And you should see that it relies on the charge and charge comes from dissociation of electrolyte. Without electrolyte, there will be no charge. Without charge, there will be no prevention by this technique. Okay, So the technique here relies on electrolyte. So that means if your solvent is organic liquid, like uh, toluene or benzene, okay, or even vegetable oil, which cannot dissociate to give you ions, then this technique would completely fail. There will be no double layer form and your particles would eventually agglomerate. The second technique that we can use to prevent agglomeration is called steric stabilization. Steric stabilization relies on steric effects from long chain molecules. Okay, So we will use long chain molecules as a bumper for the collision of particles. So the basic concept you need to understand how to put long chain molecules onto the surface of the particles. Okay, and the long chain molecules are usually polymer. So before putting polymers onto the surface, you have to put polymer into the solvent first. And you have to understand interaction between polymer and solvent. And solvent can be in this in this case solvent can be aqueous solvent or water based solvent. It can also be organic solvent. Okay? The solvent in this case is not limited to electrolyte anymore. So if we put polymer into solvent and somehow polymer molecular structure expand. All right? So you have to imagine molecular structure of polymer to be a strand of molecules, long chain molecules. It may curl like this. Okay? If the curling of the polymer molecules tends to release to be released like this. So if the polymer molecules tends to expand within the solvent, we will call the solvent to be good solvent. All right. On the other hand, if we put polymer into the solvent and polymer chain tends to coil up like this picture, we will call the solvent to be poor solvent. Being good or being poor is just a notation. Okay, It's just the name. It's not about a characteristic of the solvent. It's just the name. And you have to realize that one particular solvent may be good solvent for one polymer and maybe poor solvent for another polymer. Okay? So this being good or poor depends on the interaction between polymer and solvent. Why they are being expand, why they are being coiled up, we will not discuss in this course. Okay? Now, once we have polymer, we have to put polymer onto the surface of our particles. We can put polymer onto the surface and let them interact. Interaction here makes polymer bound to the solid. It can be bound by many ways. 
okay the first one is called anchoring anchoring means you have covalent bond between the polymer and the surface of the particles and covalent bond is normally irreversible so once you form a bond the polymer will stay there okay you may also have adsorption of polymer onto the surface the adsorption is not as strong as the anchoring okay but of course adsorption may be divided into two categories physical adsorption or chemical adsorption physical adsorption will be weaker than chemical adsorption all right but these two would allow polymer to stay with the surface now we will uh, discuss each case of the solvent let's start with a good solvent first keep in mind that good solvent means polymer tends to expand its molecular structure so if I put polymer onto the surface of the particles the green area here is the enlargement f uh, part of my particles if I put polymer like this picture I somehow add polymer or adhere polymer onto the surface and the density of polymer onto the surface is not very dense it's not very high density this is called low coverage of the polymer okay now if I have two particles in adjacent of each other like this picture remember within good solvent polymer tends to expand so these polymer like to being expand they do not like to be coiling up all right so if they if two particles come closer together by Brownian motion at some certain distance these so-called bumper of the particles formed by the polymers would interact with each other okay this area because the density of the polymer within this area becomes double okay and this area makes polymer having lower degree of freedom the polymer cannot move as freely as before all right lower degree of freedom means lower entropy all right when you have delta s smaller than zero please understand that this delta s means entropy before two particles entangle and entropy after two particles entangles the difference is delta s okay the delta s so after entangle entangling subtracted by before entangling should less than zero which makes delta G to be greater than zero delta G greater than zero is not spontaneous okay so when it is not spontaneous it means that this situation this picture is very really less likely to occur in other words once two polymers two polymer from two sides start interacting within good solvent they tend to repel each other right away they will not allow this picture to take place that's the way we prevent agglomeration because as long as two green area does not join together agglomeration will not occur okay on the other hand if I have high coverage of polymer onto the particles so particles are formed densely on the surface like this picture when two particles comes together now then interaction of these polymers would force the polymer itself to coil up okay because there's no room for polymer to entangle anymore 
coiling up like this is against the nature of polymer in good solvent. Remember, for good solvent, polymer likes to stay as a straight line. So being coiling up like this is not spontaneous either. So once they start coiling like this, they tend to push each other away. So again, this situation will not occur, and eventually, two particles will not agglomerate. So as I said from the very beginning, for steric stabilization, we will use polymer to act as the bumper from particles. What about for poor solvent? In poor solvent, if the coverage is low, the density of polymer on the surface is not as dense. In poor solvent, polymer tends to coil up. All right, when you have two particles coming to each other like this, now you have entanglement of two part uh, of two polymer chains. Entanglement within poor solvent is somewhat f favorite. Is somewhat favor. Okay, so. Poor solvent or polymer in poor solvent likes to being messy. So coiling up will be promoted with within this area of entanglement. So therefore, this picture is very spontaneous. So that means you will have two particles joining with each other eventually. So that's not. The situation that we want, all right. So keep in mind, whenever you have poor solvent, you cannot, you or you should not have low coverage of polymer. On the other hand, if you have high coverage of polymer, when two two particles come together, the polymer's layer will be compressed. Okay. And compression of this polymer would eventually uh, non-spontaneous and push these two particles apart, just like spring. Okay. So we have two kind of solvent. Total of four situation, being low coverage or high coverage. The only situation that you need to avoid is this one. Low coverage within poor solvent. The rest can prevent agglomeration. The good thing about steric stabilization is that it is somewhat stable. That means it is permanent. So whether or not you have, uh, let's say you you have stabilization, and you somewhat dry the solution. Remove the solvent. Okay, two particles would stick together. Once you put solvent back, then two particles can be redispersed again by this technique. Okay, so this technique allows redispersibility. Unlike electrostatic stabilization, for electrostatic stabilization, if you remove the electrolyte, if you Make the powder dry. There's no longer electrolytes. Particles would accumulate. Once you reintroduce electrolytes, redispersion will not occur for electrostatic stabilization. Okay, but for steric stabilization, we can redisperse particles. It can also be used at high particle concentration. It doesn't matter whether you have high or low number of particles within the system. It can be used for multi-phase system, and the solvent does not have to be electrolyte. Okay, so according to this, it seems like steric stabilization is better than electrostatic stabilization. But you have to understand. Everything comes with a price. What is disadvantages of steric stabilization? If you think carefully, now we have to put 
polymer onto the surface either permanently or semi-permanently okay to prevent agglomeration that means that particular area of the surface that is occupied by polymer is no longer useful especially if you want to use nanoparticle as a catalyst if you want to use nanoparticles to accelerate ex uh, reactions that particular site is already occupied by polymer is no longer available for reaction so your catalyst activity would be lower okay so this steric stabilization may not interfere with other with the applications like optical applic applications but in chemical reaction or chemical application it would give you significant disadvantages okay so whether you choose the electrostatic or steric stabilization you need to be very careful on the application that you want to use your nanoparticles there's another way it's called mixed interaction you can combine steric stabilization and electrostatic stabilization together to make stabilization even stronger the way we can mix two techniques together is either by using polymer onto the charged particles so you make the particle charge and then adhere polymer outside or you can use polymer that is also charged by itself there's so many kinds of polymer that can be charged okay either way you can have both effects together all right so for this lecture in general we talk about agglomeration which is a very common problem for nanoparticle synthesis in order to obtain nanoparticles we need to prevent agglomeration and there are two ways two main ways to do so the electrostatic stabilization which utilizes the charge around particles or steric stabilization with which util utilizes the polymer long chain polymer to prevent agglomeration okay so for next lex next lecture we will try to start the synthesis of nanoparticles